Thank you for joining us for another lesson from God's Word. The Streetsboro Church of Christ is located at 1386 Russell Drive, Streetsboro, Ohio, 44241. If you're ever in the area, we hope that you'll stop in and worship with us. We hope that you'll enjoy this lesson brought to you by our minister, Ralph Price. We finished a series last week that I had been doing, a, a three-part series. And one of the, I think one of the responsibilities of a preacher is to make sure that the, your preaching is balanced. And there are certain topics, I think, that need to be preached on a fairly regular basis. I was looking through my past sermons um, that I had done and saw that it has actually been seven years since I preached on the topic of abortion. I, I really feel like that probably should be preached every year. Um, but um, I, I feel that definitely this is something that we need to cover and we need to think about uh, today. And so that is the topic of our lesson today, God's view of abortion. Four days before I was born... January 22nd, 1973, uh, the Supreme Court made a decision in the Roe versus Wade in which they decided, or I guess it should be said, they struck down all laws that forbade the abortion of unborn children. Since that time, uh, 44 years ago, approximately 60 million babies have been aborted in the United States. What's sad is I can remember the first time I preached here on the topic of abortion, that number was 40 million. Uh, in the time that I've been here, 15 years, 20, more, 20 million more babies have been aborted. Nearly one out of every five pregnancies end in abortion. Some areas of the country, that number is much higher. For example, in New York, in 2013, 37% of all pregnancies ended in abortion. A study was done in 2004 where young women who had had an abortion were asked to give a reason for their abortion. And uh, if they so chose to give that reason, here were some of the results. Less than half a percent is because they were victims of rape. Three percent of the uh, women surveyed said that uh, there were health problems with the baby. Four percent said there were health problems with the mother and they felt they needed an abortion. Four percent said they chose the abortion because a baby would interfere with their education. Nineteen percent just said they didn't want any more children. They'd had enough. 23% said they could not afford a baby. And 25% said they just were not ready for a child. That was the largest group. Just not ready for a child. We need to ask ourselves as people who are concerned about the will of God, is abortion moral? Is it right? Is it okay? And I think most of, it, most of you know the position I'm going to take on that question. The central question that arises when we ask about abortion and is it right or is it wrong is when does life begin? Because I think we're safe in saying that almost everybody would agree that it is morally wrong to kill a human being. A living human being. I don't, you know, there may be a few who don't see that as something that is wrong, but I think we would all agree. So the question arises: when does life begin? Is, is the baby in the womb a living human being, or is the baby in the womb something else? The Supreme Court, when they made the decision in Roe versus Wade, they wrote the following about that question. They wrote we need not resolve the difficult question of when life begins. When those trained in the respective disciplines of medicine, philosophy, and theology are unable to arrive at any consensus, 
The judiciary at this point in the development of man's knowledge is not in a position to speculate as to the answer. So basically they say, if those who are schooled in medicine and uh, philosophy and theology or religion, if they can't come to any kind of understanding or agreement as to when life begins, they say, who are we to try to make that determination? And so they just sort of wash their hands of the whole question when they made their decision. What's interesting, though, is uh, it seems that things have changed a little bit in that uh, in 2004, there was a, the Unborn Victims of Violence Act was passed. It's also called the Lacey and Connor Law, uh, I believe, after Lacey and Connor Peterson, the young woman who was killed by her husband uh, when she was pregnant. And that, uh, that act, it recognizes a child in the womb as, and I quote, a member of the species Homo sapiens at any stage of development who is carried in the womb. And so in 2004, it was acknowledged that a baby in the womb is actually a human being. And if an individual kills a woman and in so doing kills the baby, or if somehow just kills the baby, but maybe doesn't kill the mother, then that person can be charged with murder. And 38 states have laws uh, that recognize the life of a baby in the womb as a human being. And therefore, if someone does something that leads to the death of that baby, they can be charged with murder. So really what it boils down to is it seems if the mother does not want the baby, it's not human. But... If the mother wants the child, then the government is willing to consider it as a human being. Very inconsistent in their view. If it can be shown that life begins in the womb, then abortion is murder. And it's something that we ought to stand against. And so I want, first of all, to look at four views of when it is exactly that life begins. And the first one I'm not going to spend hardly any time on other than just to mention it because there are so few that actually hold this view. The first view is that an infant becomes human at some point after birth. Now that, that, that's kind of strange. People who hold this view do not equate life with humanity. So to them, a child is living before it's actually human. So a child is born into this world and it may be living, but it's not yet a human being. Some have even suggested that babies should be examined, you know, as they are. But, you know, babies that are found to be unhealthy, babies that are defective, you know, in some physical way, that maybe those babies should, you know, be, be put to death because they're not yet human beings. That view is not held by many, thankfully. And certainly there's no biblical basis for a view like that whatsoever. So I don't feel any need to really answer uh, that view of when life begins. I think the vast majority of us acknowledge that someone who has been born and is drawing breath is definitely uh, alive. There is no question about that. But the second view is one that's held more commonly, and that is that Babies become human after taking their first breath of air. After they take their first breath of air, they can be viewed as human. Now, some even say that there's a biblical basis uh, for this. In Genesis 2 and verse 7, uh, when God made Adam and Eve, it says, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. And so those who want to justify abortion by saying, well, uh, you know, a baby isn't alive, actually, or a human being until they take their first breath, they, they might go to Genesis 2 and verse 7 and say, see, Adam was not a living being until God gave him breath, or until he breathed, if you will. This, this argument is invalid because babies are not formed in the same way that Adam was formed. It's not a valid argument. Adam was formed by God. He never was a baby. 
And therefore, you cannot use Adam as an example uh, for people who come into this world in a natural way. A child actually doesn't wait until birth to breathe. Uh, oxygen is received through the mother uh, pretty from the time of conception up until birth. Okay, And so uh, oxygen is just received in a different way. Other uh, criteria as well make it clear that the baby is actually a living soul before it is born. Look, if you would, at Genesis 9, verses 4 and 5. This passage is not related to abortion, but it teaches a fact that I think argues against abortion. God says, you shall not eat the flesh with its life, that is, its blood. Surely your lifeblood I will demand a reckoning from the hand of every beast I will require it, and from the hand of man. From the hand of every man's brother I will require the life of man. Here we learn that the life of the flesh is actually, the Bible says it's in the blood. And that's a fairly profound statement considering that man didn't understand that uh, up until a few hundred years ago, really. You think about how George Washington died by... Uh, bloodletting, they took his blood because they thought the disease that he had was found in his blood so they would just draw the blood out and draw out the disease. So, But the Bible makes it clear that the life of the flesh is in the blood and you need to understand that an unborn baby, a baby in the womb, has its own blood supply independent of its mother's blood supply and usually a, a different type than the mother has. Now, the passage which was read for us and before we began, Proverbs 6, verses 16 and 17, says it announces some things that God hates. Six things God hates, yes, seven that are an abomination to Him. And that is, one of those things that is mentioned is hands that shed innocent blood. Unborn babies have, again, they have their own blood supply. They are an, an independent uh, individual being, separate and apart, from their mother, how God must hate the hands of abortionists who take the life of innocent babies. So, uh, babies become human after taking their first breath. There's no biblical basis for that belief, that statement. Number three, some argue that life begins when the baby can survive outside of its mother's body on its own. When a baby can survive outside the mother's body. This is often called viability. Uh, but the baby can survive outside of mom, then it is a living being. Again, there's no biblical um, foundation for this belief. And when you think about it, this view actually means it's, it's really a measure of medical technology, isn't it? Because... You know, we can keep babies alive now that would have died um, years ago, a few decades ago or longer. You know, um, there are babies that are born that weigh a pound who are not fully developed. But because of the medical technology that we have, we can nurse those babies to health and help them to stay alive while they grow and mature, uh, as is the natural way. But, you know... 100 years ago, those babies would have died because that technology did not exist. And let me suggest to you that I, I truly believe the day is coming when we will possess the knowledge to grow a human being without it ever being in a woman. I believe that day will come. I'm not, I'm not arguing whether it's right or wrong. And I'm not saying that man can create life. They're still going to have to start with life to then clone human beings. But we're getting closer. They can do it already with animals, with some animals. And so to say that a, a being becomes alive after it can survive outside the mother, well, going by that standard then your view has changed over the years. And the more advanced that science becomes and the longer that we can uh, keep a baby alive, then this, your view of when life begins changes. So it's not really a valid argument. And there's another consequence of that belief. 
If a baby who cannot survive on its own is not considered to be a human being, what about a person who's been in an accident and maybe needs life support to survive? Does that person cease being a human being because they cannot survive on their own and they need support? No, they've not ceased to be human. So the idea that a life begins when something can survive on its own is not a valid view. The fourth view, and I believe this is a correct view, and it's certainly the view that is held by the Bible, by God, is that life begins at conception. Life begins when the baby is first conceived in the womb. In Psalm 139, verses 14 to 16, David writes, I will praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works, and that my soul knows very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. That's a poetic way of saying you knew me in the womb, okay? Your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed, and in your book they all were written, the days fashioned for me, when as yet there were none of them. What is David saying there? He's saying, God, you knew me. You had a plan for me even before I was completely formed in the womb. You, you knew me and you had a plan for me and for my life. And certainly that is taught in the scriptures and we're going to see in a few moments some other passages that say much the same thing, that God views the child in the womb the same as He views a child that is outside the womb that has been born into this world. All that is added to a baby after conception is nourishment and oxygen. Nourishment and oxygen. The fertilized ovum is genetically identifiable as a unique human being. That, that egg that has been fertilized has its own genetic code. It's unique. At three weeks, the heart begins to beat. So before the woman probably even knows that she's pregnant, that baby has a beating heart. At four weeks, again, before they probably know they're pregnant, the brain and the spinal cord are well underway to being formed. And at the end of six weeks, all of the baby's organs are there. They're in place and they're functioning to some extent. From six weeks on, they just continue to grow and improve uh, from that time on. So you think about most abortions take place after six weeks. Even And so you have a human being that is identifiable, albeit very small and in an early stage of development, but a unique human being that has all the characteristics of a human. It's just a human that's in the womb. So in God's view, life starts at conception. A few of those passages that I mentioned, Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 49, talking about himself, In verses 1 and 5 says, Listen, O coastlands, to me, and take heed, you people from afar. The Lord has called me from the womb. From the matrix of my mother, he's made mention of my name. In verse 5, And now the Lord says, Who formed me from the womb to be his servant. So here, again, Isaiah points out that God was aware of him in the womb. God knew his name, if you will. Uh, before he was ever born and had a plan for him. We also could look at Jeremiah 1 and verse 5 where he says much the same thing. He says, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. This is God speaking to Jeremiah. Before you were born, I sanctified you. I ordained you a prophet to the nation. How God must hate the hands of abortionists who take these lives from us from Him before they ever have a chance to draw breath. God has a plan for each and every one of us. And abortion robs these individuals of that plan that God has. Job, uh, in Job 39, 13-17, listen to how the ostrich is described. And I put this in here because, well, you'll see why. The wings of the ostrich wave proudly, but are her wings and pinions like the kindly storks? For she leaves her eggs on the ground and warms them in the dust. She forgets that a foot may crush them or that a wild beast may break them. She treats her young harshly 
as though they were not hers. Her labor is in vain without concern because God deprived her of wisdom and did not endow her with understanding. So the picture is put forth of this bird that lays an egg and just leaves it and is not concerned for it whatsoever and and the dangers that might befall it. And that situation is described as this bird has been deprived of wisdom and not endowed with understanding. If that can be said about a bird, how do we think that God feels about a human being who does not care about an unborn child? In the scriptures, it might interest you to know that God uses the same word to describe a child in the womb as he does to a child that has been born. In Luke 1 and verse 41, in regard to John the Baptist, it says it happened when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary that the babe leaped in her womb. The word babe is brephos in the Greek And if you look over at Luke 2 and verse 12, this is in regard to Jesus after he had been born. It says, this will be the sign to you. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes lying in a manger. Same word, brephos. God used the same word to describe a babe lying in a manger as he did to one in the womb. That's because there is no distinction with God. Both are living human beings. One was in the womb and one had been born. From this, I think we can see that God considers a fetus in the womb uh, as a human being. You know, that's one of the ways that, um, I don't know, those who are for abortion, that they try to lessen the impact of what they're doing. They're not killing babies. They're removing fetuses from the womb. I remember one time a a person, a, a woman that I knew lost a baby. And they were told um, when the scan was done that there was a fetal demise. Fetal demise. It's not the baby died. It was fetal demise. They dehumanize the babe in the womb. What should we do as Christians, people who want to be pleasing to God, people who recognize the value of life, what can we do to try to make things better? I am not suggesting you do like some crazy people do and they they go to they turn to violence and go to abortion clinics and do break the law. I'm not suggesting anything like that. But as Christians, here's what we can do. Number one, we can pray. We can pray, first of all, for our leaders. In 1 Timothy 2, 1 and 2, we know that that's something that we should always be doing. Paul writes, therefore I exhort first of all that supplications, prayers, intercessions, And giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings and all who are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and reverence. We need to pray for our leaders that they make decisions that will eventually make this practice illegal. That abortion might be seen for what it is, and that is murder. Not only should we pray for our leaders, but also recognize that there are young women who are pregnant and they're in a very difficult situation and we ought to pray for them. They have a very important decision to make. Most women who abort children are panicked. They're maybe uninformed about what's going to happen. They're desperate. They're often very young and afraid of the consequences if it is found out that they are pregnant. And so they're in a very difficult situation. We need to pray for young women who are in those situations. Some are even pressured by boyfriends or even sometimes by their parents to get abortions. Number two, we need to be politically active. We need to be politically active. Our country allows abortion because we have put people in power 
who see nothing wrong with abortion. That's why abortion is legal in this country. This has happened, I think, in a large part because people who believe in abortion and accept it, they've made more noise politically than the rest of us have who are against it. How can we make a difference politically in helping to try to get that law changed? We need to realize how important this issue is. It deals with the life of innocent human beings who are being murdered. We need to, by any legal means possible, politically, try to get that law changed. You write your representatives and senators. Let them know where you stand on that. And most importantly, we are blessed in this country in that we get to vote for our leaders. We get to vote for who we want to lead this country. And we cannot turn off our Christianity when we step in the voting booth. We need to know where the candidates stand on this topic. And shame on us if we put people in power who are going to continue to allow abortion. Now you say, well, one person can't change it. Well, you, you're, you're probably right. Maybe one person can. But I'll tell you this, if we don't put people in power who are against abortion, it never will be changed. The process will never be started. It may take decades to get it illegal. But it has to start by us putting people in power who are against abortion. The Bible describes a Christian as the salt of the earth. One of the ways in this country that we can be the salt of the earth is by voting for people who are going to uphold God's law. And I know, I know that sometimes you look at the candidates and, and you say neither one of them are going to do that. But we need to vote for the one that we think is most likely going to have this law, at least start the process of having this law repealed. You are the salt of the earth. If the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? We need to serve that function as the salt of the earth, as the light of the world in which we live. How dare we let political affiliations cause us to turn a blind eye to the murdering of innocent children. Number three, what can we do? We can teach. We can teach. Number one, we need to teach the biblical view of sexuality. And that is Hebrews 13 and verse 4, Marriage is honorable among all, but in the bed undefiled. But fornicators and adulterers God will judge. We need to teach what the Bible teaches, that Sex outside of the marriage relationship is wrong. Why are there so many unwanted pregnancies? Well, part of the reason is that so many people are having sexual relations outside of marriage and, and they don't want children. And so they, they decide to have them aborted. By, by trying to teach and get people to adhere to the biblical view of sexuality, this problem would be relieved. If only married couples partook of sexual intimacy, then these children would be being conceived in relationships where they would be wanted. And number two, we can teach the biblical view of human life. And that is that man, Genesis 1 and verse 27, is made in the image of God. Life is to be valued. Life is is to be protected at all stages of development. Jesus said in Matthew 7 and verse 12, Whatever you want men to do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. Ronald Reagan one time made the statement. He said, I've noticed that everyone that is for abortion has already been born. I, I imagine most of us are glad we were born. We're glad that our parents did not choose to have us aborted. So why would we think that it's okay to kill another baby? We're glad that we're here. They deserve an opportunity. They deserve a chance. I understand, again, that many times women feel trapped and they panic. But even in such cases that child can be put up for adoption. That is always an option. There are always 
Couples who are unable to have children of their own who desperately want a child. We've had some in this congregation through the years that would, would take that child and would raise it and it would be loved. The argument is pro-choice or pro-life. Well, I'm both in this. I'm pro-life in that I believe it's wrong to murder children. And I'm pro-choice because everybody has the right to choose not to have sexual relations and therefore not have an unwanted pregnancy. We have the right to choose to let that baby live and let that baby lead a, a happy and productive life. Again, this is one of those types of lessons that I think needs to be taught because this, I think, is one of the huge injustices that exists in this world, not just in the United States, but around the world. And it's something that we need to speak up and speak out against because certainly God is displeased with the hands that shed innocent blood. <clears throat> We're going to take a moment now to offer the Lord's invitation. If there are any here who have not yet obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ, we offer you the opportunity to become a Christian this morning. We haven't dealt with the topic of the plan of salvation and what it takes to become a Christian, but maybe you've heard this before and you've been thinking about it. You have to hear the Word of God. You have to believe in Jesus and repent of your sins. Confess your faith and be baptized. If there's any here that haven't done that and, and you're thinking about it, maybe you've been thinking about it, we urge you to make the decision today to become a Christian. We're about to sing a song, and if you would like to be baptized into Christ today, we can do that. If you're a Christian who has ceased to live faithfully, we would be glad to pray for you if you so desire, or help you in any way that we can. If there's any need, we encourage you to come as we stand and sing. Thanks for listening. If you have any questions or comments, Ralph can be reached at rprice at streetsboroughchurch.org or by calling 330-626-4282. If you would like to learn more about the Church of Christ, we offer free Bible correspondence courses by mail and home Bible studies. We hope that you enjoyed this lesson. Feel free to come visit us. We would love to have the opportunity to meet you.